Go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Jim Holmes with Regina Waterwatch. And how did you feel you did in the debate tonight? I think the debate went well. I think we managed to get our major points over about how important water is, and particularly in this part of the country, and that, and that you know, wastewater is part of that water system. So I think that was good. I think we managed to get the points out about what a dubious deal this is at best, um, and the risks that, that the city's putting us into. So I think that was all good. I was a little disappointed that the mayor just seemed to keep repeating the same points over and over again. Sewage and, and keep, this, sewage that, yeah. sewage this. Well, yeah. more like the, you know, like the design did build that he couldn't quite, you know, he had an idea, and it's, it's like this sort of rigidity of mind, right, that yeah. he followed through for, and that, that was troubling. Um, but in any case, I think it was good. I think it was helpful, and I hope people found it useful. I found it useful, and I had a good time. Good. All right, thanks. Thank Introduce yourself, please. Okay, I'm Catherine Gibson. And, and Catherine, uh, what did you uh, talk to the clerk about? I, I talked to her through emails. We emailed back and forth. I asked her how to find out where I was supposed to vote and commented that we normally get something in the mail saying, you, you vote at such and such a poll. And she, in her reply, said, we will not be sending out voter cards. Okay. All right, thanks very much. All right, introduce yourself quickly. Uh, I'm John Cameron. I'm a, uh, I'm a writer, blogger uh, in Regina. Uh, mostly my writing is with the Prairie Dog. I used to be the editor of the Carillon. And what did you uh, think University. of the debate, John? Um, I thought it was a good debate. I thought it was well handled. Uh, one thing that I thought about it uh, was that there were some opportunities to answer direct questions that I think... Uh, I think both sides um, sort of missed, but uh, I honestly felt like the mayor in particular sort of missed. Um, an example just been nice. you can think of? Uh, again, an example. Uh, we were just talking about this before the camera went on. But uh, one example was uh, in the question of whether or not the $58.5 million in federal funding um, was the amount we would receive or just the maximum. The question was phrased uh, that that's the maximum we can receive correct, like, quote. Um, uh, and Fugere's answer was, yeah, that's the maximum we can receive, which is truthful within the parameters of the question asked, but not helpful to anybody who's trying to make up their mind on the that decision. That calls into question because the, it's two, not, yeah, the 276 numbers based apparently on that amount. Well, sure, but it's so, also that this is a this is a public forum. I'm gesturing with a cucumber. This is a public forum, uh, and it's it's meant to try and give people who are voting... Uh, do you want me to look right in the lens? No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's meant to try and give people who are voting... Uh, as much information as they possibly can so they can make an honest and fair and well-informed decision on uh, what's being made. And answers like that uh, are contrary to the spirit overall of something like this forum. All right, thanks very much. You're welcome. Please introduce yourself and let me know what you thought of the debate. Uh, hello, I'm Aaron Weir. I thought it was an excellent debate uh, this evening on the upcoming uh, referendum about the wastewater treatment plant. I thought that Jim Holmes from Regina Water Watch made some really excellent points about the public option actually being a better deal uh, for taxpayers and for ratepayers. I think he made excellent points about the importance of water as a public resource and the need to keep public control of it uh, rather than putting it in the hands of a private corporation. Uh, which is motivated by profit and which might walk away from the project sometime in the next 30 years. Is there like a key moment that sticks out for you uh, that either what the mayor said or what uh, Jim said about uh, during the debate that just sort of seemed like a gotcha or anything uh, catchy like that? Well, I suppose in these debates, you always look for the knockout punch, and the commentary afterwards is usually that there wasn't a knockout punch, and probably tonight there wasn't one moment like that, but I think there were a few uh, really important uh, arguments that were made. Uh, one point that was a little bit odd, I thought, was the mayor's claim uh, that no one could be laid off under the P3, because, of course, even under the existing QP contract, or any collective agreement for that matter, there is a provision for layoffs. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, Aaron. I appreciate it.
welcome you to tonight's debate. My name is Dale Eisler, and I'm going to be moderator. Before I introduce our two debaters and outline the agreed upon rules of engagement, allow me to provide some context for the discussion that's about to unfold. The subject we're dealing with, as I'm sure you're all well aware, is the unanimous, the unanimous proposal by the Regina City Council to construct a new wastewater treatment plant using a public-private partnership or P3 model to finance, design, build, and operate the facility. The P3 approach is being proposed rather than what might be termed a more traditional, fully public model, often referred to as design bid build. Instead of publicly funded, owned and operated, the P3 project would be privately financed and run. Ownership of the facility would remain in public hands with the asset held by the city of Virginia. A key reason uh, cited by the mayor and council for the P3 model is $58.5 million in federal funding that is available for the project. The funding is part of one and a quarter billion, $1.25 billion uh, that's in the, this year's federal budget that was set aside for public-private partnerships in excess of $100 million. This uh, particular wastewater plant is estimated to cost uh, $224.3 million. As a result of a petition organized by a group under the banner of Water Watch, which opposes the Petri model, council agreed to hold a public vote on September 25th, allowing Regina citizens to say whether or not to proceed with a public-private partnership. The valid question is, quote, that the council of the city of Regina publicly finance, operate, and maintain the new wastewater treatment plant for Regina through a traditional design design bid build approach. While there is divided opinion on the best policy instrument to build a facility, there is at least general agreement a new sewage treatment plant is needed. So the question is not whether to build it or not, it's what's the best way to achieve the greatest public good. And that's where the consensus breaks down and why we're here tonight. Hopefully we can probe this issue in a way that will present the facts and allow the kind of citizens to make a fully informed decision when they cast their ballot for or against the question next week. To do that, our objective is to focus on facts, not rhetoric. We want to address the public policy choice and what is in the best long-term interest of the citizens of Regina. Certainly, there are plenty of facts and studies we can use to examine the issue. The use of public-private partnerships as a policy tool is certainly not new. We have decades of experience with PGs in Canada. In fact, Canada is, is among the world leaders in the use of PGs. So this is not about breaking new policy grounds. The question is whether it is the right model for this type of public project. Part of the struggle is to untangle public from private interest, to determine the public good and private benefit can inter intersect and work together for the broader interest of the community. Our debaters tonight are the key figures who have driven the public discussion to date. Speaking in favor of the ballot question, which in this case means opposed to the P3 proposal, is Jim Holmes <coughs> of the group Water Watch, and Jim is my far right. Your left.
after serving five terms on city council. He holds a Bachelor of Arts with honors from St. Francis Xavier University and a Master's of Science degree from the London School of Economics. Michael has lived and worked in several provinces, Asia and Europe, and his career has focused on economic development. So, in the case before us tonight, when we uh, talk about the ballot question at least, yes means no, and no means yes. <laughs> I'm confused yet. Hopefully by the end of the night, everything will be clear. Now I realize that public policy is the application of politics, but our objective tonight is to keep, is to keep the discussion moving in facts and depoliticize it as much as possible. Before we have the debate has been agreed to in advance by the participants. Each will have a maximum of 10 minutes for opening remarks. The order of the opening remarks is determined by a coin toss. Following opening statements, each will have five minutes of rebuttal. Following the rebuttal, we will move to the questions. Mr. Holmes and Mr. Fugier each submitted three questions that were shared with both debaters earlier this week. The debaters will have a maximum of three minutes to respond to each of their three questions. We will then go to written questions from the audience. If necessary, in case of the presentation or overlap, questions will be moved into these. We have people in, uh, uh, here that are collecting the questions from you. These are written questions, so we don't have four mics. So if you have a question written out on the card, just raise your hand and come get it. Uh, during the question period, I'll uh, use the prerogative of the chair to ask questions for clarification, but my intention is to keep any uh, of my interventions to a minimum. It's not about the moderators, but the debaters. We will conclude with final comments of three minutes each from the two debaters. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, I ask people to avoid outbursts of applause or comments who are here to listen to, the, to our debaters. If you have a question, submit it. If not, then sit back and listen. Hopefully by the end of the evening, those of you who are still undecided will feel they have a better understanding of the issue and the public policy choice for the city. <laughs> so, let the, the debate begin. Speaking first, uh, about 10 minutes, is Jim Holmes. Good evening, and thank you to the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School for this important debate. Almost all water and wastewater treatment plants in the world are publicly financed, operated, and maintained. A hundred years ago, we tried to start a public sewage collection system after an outbreak of typhoid fever. Water and wastewater was and is essential to life. Wastewater is 99% water. Think shower, flush, washing dishes, and laundry. We discharge our wastewater into the water source of hundreds of thousands of people downstream of us to the east. And here downstream to one and a half million people to the west who discharge their wastewater into our water source. We all share a responsibility to respect this essential resource. None of our major comparators Saskatoon, Calgary, or Edmonton to privatize their water or wastewater systems. Yorkton, with a population of 17,000, built a new water treatment plant in 2012, winning an environmental innovation award. It was a traditional design, bid, build project with federal government funding, but it was not a P3. It came in on schedule and on budget, democratically controlled. Publicly financed water and wastewater treatment is a public success, public sector success story. The city's privatization proposal, on the other hand, is bad public policy. And tonight I'm trying to give you ten reasons why I think it's bad policy. One, a private corporation will control the plan. Now the city claims it will control the plan, but the Deloitte, their consultants report is clear. Pages 15. 5, 15, and twice in the conclusions on page 23 of their data, the city must transfer operational control to the private operator in the P3 model. Two, lack of independent evaluation. When I make a major purchase, I always listen to the salesperson. They have good information. But buyer beware. And Deloitte is selling this privatization. It's a substantial part of their business. They are sponsoring members of the Canadian Council for Public-Private Partnerships. This is from their website. The Council is a proponent of evidence-based public policy in 
in support of P3s. So they did. The Lloyd built a case for P3 privatization. The Lloyd has the same relationship to P3s that the bond rating agency did to toxic mortgage securities. They're selling what they're supposed to be evaluating. It's a secret 30-year deal. The Lloyd's report was released in January, dated January this year, and it was missing all the crucial calculations and assumptions. The response to our access to information request was heavily redacted. All the key information was erased, the pages were blank. We need to know, in ballpark figures, the borrowing costs, how much higher the private interest rate will be, and what the return on equity, the profit of the private corporation will be. Now, no one has more experience with the P3 model than Britain. Both the Conservatives and the Labour Party have been promoting them since 1992. The Home Party British House of Commons Treasury Committee issued a study on P3s in 2011. This is what they said. The difference in finance costs means P3 projects are always more expensive to fund over the life of the project. This represents a significant cost to the taxpayers. Only the Mayor claims the difference between public and private borrowing rates is insignificant. So if it's insignificant, why is it secret? The excuse for not releasing borrowing costs is this would undermine the bidding process. But the bidders know the city's borrowing rate, how much higher their rate is, and their desired rate of profit. Only the voters of Regina are being kept in the dark. Four, the public pays for private profit. The light acknowledges that the tradition of public tendering is cheaper until you figure in the PPP candidate rent. The P3 model uses our federal tax dollars to subsidize the creation of an unregulated private monopoly. This is a recipe for price gouging and for loss of democratic accountability. Our tax dollars do not get us a better plan. Our tax, do our tax dollars get investors a better rate of return. Number five, higher financing costs wipe out the federal grant. The private corporation does not bring in the money to the table. That's clear to the report. It just borrows the money in our name. And we're going to pay it back through our water bills. Private corporate borrowing is higher cost. How much higher is the secret? So General Water Watch Commission Hugh McKenzie, an economist, to analyze the project. Using very cautious figures, he estimated $95.9 million of increased financing costs. The entire federal grant will be wiped out. And we will pay $37.4 million of higher water bills over 30 years. All of McKenzie's calculations are available at ReginaWaterWatch.ca. This is the only publicly available evaluation. Remember, the city still won't use its calculations. Six, do we have value for money? Any credible, any credible value for money evaluation must be open and transparent. Citizens must be able to validate the assumptions and check the calculations. None of this is possible with the court report. All of their calculations are secret. The Ontario, the Auditor General of Ontario, criticized excess, excessive uh, risk transfer advantage. So criticized the risk transfer advantage being assigned to P3s as being excessive. The British House of Commons Treasury Committee said raises concerns that the value of money for appraisal system is biased to favor P3s. But the real risk of the P3 is that the corporation can always walk away. And we know from other P3 projects, the corporations do walk away. We can't walk away from our sewage. Seven, the cost runs are built in. In 2012, the city said the plant would cost $153 million. Today, that estimate is $234 million. That includes $10 million in fees to lawyers, brokers, and consultants. The city hasn't told us about yet, although Councilor Young admitted it. Remember how the airlines used to advertise those super low fares? And then when you went and signed up for them, they hit you with all those added fees and costs? That's illegal now, unless you're the city of Regina. <laughs> There's no wonder P3 proponents say they often come in on budget. This project already has a 50% cost overrun before it's even started. A public tenure can also include fixed price. The mayors would have to believe that a P3 model is the only model that includes fixed price. The contract will pay for any cost overruns or late completion. But publicly financed projects can be included fixed price contract. 
just recently the city of Saskatoon built the Circle Drive South Bridge using traditional public tender and with a fixed price contract. Now, water back in the public hands. The city plans B3 is the way of the future, but the real trend is the municipalities taking back water services from the privatizers. Just two weeks ago, Berlin took back its water system after 14 years of privatization. The Paris City, Indianapolis, Brussels, Atlanta, Hamilton, Ontario all took their water systems back from the privatizers. Sounds like it all looked real. But there are sad examples of cities being banned in Hoosville by complete the privatization. So this is my last point. Number 10. You can't trust the city's numbers. Citizens so want accurate numbers to make a critical decision. The city says, <coughs> model costs the average citizen another $276 a year. This is the city council that raised water and sewer rates by 70% in seven years, or $600 for the average homeowner. We are told it was mainly to pay for the new wastewater treatment plant. <coughs> the city says this rate of increase will continue indefinitely under privatization, even after the plant is built. The mayor gets the $276 an arbitrary number, never approved by city council suggest it was invented by a spin doctor. Every city count, every councillor and every city official has a different explanation of how they got the $276. I suggest you that $276 is simply sewage sludge. And the city has smeared it on billboards all over town using your tax dollars. And now they're plopping in your mailbox. My two granddaughters start school this fall. The oldest one started grade five. The youngest one started four days in grade one. They will be 40 and 37 years old when this expensive, secret, private deal comes to an end. On September 25th, I'd invite you to vote yes for public water. Vote yes to keep water public. Thank you. So we sort of backed into 
why P3 would be the best. And I can tell you we've got 11 people on council who have different backgrounds, different experiences, different life experiences. We came to one conclusion. A public-private partnership will answer the question for us, and I'll tell you why. Most importantly, and very significantly, I want to make it clear here, we are not privatizing our sewage treatment plant. We own and control that. The same as when you have a house and someone comes in to refurbish your roof, change your roof, fix your, your basement, no one questions whether you own the roof or not. Someone changes your, your, uh, your furnace, the same thing. We own the facility. You have a mortgage on your house, nobody questions what's on the, on the title of the property. It's your house. Same thing. What we're doing here is we're finding a way to excess money, $58.5 million, one quarter of the cost of the facility from the federal government. Very, very important aspect when tax dollars are very tight. Very important to do that. We had other principles we wanted to, to protect here. Again, we're not selling this off. It's not privatizing. We own it. We control it. And we are not talking about drinking water. We're not talking about water. We're talking about the sewage plant. And the water system in this city does not mix with the sewage system in this city. And heaven forbid that it was the case. So, on a design bid build, and on P3, here's the features. We have a fixed price contract on a public-private partnership. Not so on a design bid build. This is a performance-based contract that the, the contractor will be responsible for all cost overruns and delays. It's very simple. It's in the contract. The companies that are going to be building this are large corporations that have done this before. They have economies of scale. They understand how to do this. City Council, the City of Regina does not build these facilities. We don't have the expertise. So it just stands to reason this would be the case. Any cost overruns. Fully 70% of design bid build in the public sector for large, large uh, projects are over budget, 70%. 83% of public-private partnerships are on time and on budget. Which would you take as a counselor? What would you say would be the best for the citizens of Virginia? Then we look at, at the 30-year project of, of maintaining and operating. Of course, the company that has this will be looking at the operation. But we control it through rates. We control it through the contract. It will be public. When, when we, if, if we go down this road, that contract will be tabled in, in uh, city council for all to see. So there's no theory or hidden deal here whatsoever. So we have that. We also have a performance contract that they must continue to clean the water as per what the, what the province says. And these are higher standards. We must build this by December 31st, 2016 to meet those new standards. The contractor must make sure that it's maintained and operated in a way that meets those codes, but also agreed upon predetermined codes, levels of, of, of maintenance. So at the end of the 30 years, we will have a fully maintained and operational wastewater facility that we can either continue to operate ourselves, or we can have the company continue, or another company do it 30 years from now. Very comfortable with that. We will save $20 million on that. Now, the Deloitte report, we are comfortable as council. We reviewed this for a number of years. We've seen this and we know it's, it's right. They have done this all over the world. And not just wastewater, they're financial experts as well. And 11 of us voted unanimously because we saw the obvious benefits to taxpayers. Stretching our tax dollars. Providing an opportunity to have federal infrastructure money put in here. Because otherwise you won't get it. There's no other source of money for the federal government to fund this. To me, the case is clear, absolutely clear. We, we stretch our tax dollars. We own and control. It's about sewage, not wastewater. And we have the hammer on the contract. I must tell you that uh, some of the comments about control and, and uh, secret 30-year deal is not the case. I'll offer a bottle of Mr. Holmes' comments in a few moments. The profits that you talk about are made by, in the design bid bill on his model, is the private sector that will build it there as well. So ask how much there will be. It is not a fixed price contract, as it is with the public private partnerships. We're asking you to consider this information. You've had literature given to you uh, on the outside. We're asking you to stretch your tax dollars, gain $58.5 million from the federal government, 
vote no to the motion that's before you next week at, at uh, on referendum day. Please vote no, and uh, I can tell you that the fifty-eight and a half million dollars can be used for other infrastructure that we need in the city very badly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Baron. So now uh, we're going to move into the uh, rebuttal portion of the debate. Uh, each of the debaters gets five minutes uh, to rebut uh, the opening uh, comments uh, by the other debaters. So, uh, Jim, uh, I'll go to you first. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Working? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, in a revival, you normally re restrict it to try and respond to what, what the other debater has just presented to you. So, I'll try and do that. Let's talk about some things here. I heard Mayor Fougere say that this is their uh, P3 is a defined. Oh, sorry, it's a fixed price contract. So I want to just find you. Well, if you look on the PPP Canada website, there's a guide there for municipalities, and it contains in it a definition of design bid build, which is what we're recommending. And what it says is design bid build. Public agency figures out what it is they need, they get a private company to design it, they get a private company to build it. It's often done as a fixed price contract thereby transferring the risk to the private operator. That's the definition, not mine, although it's the one I think is widely used. It's the one from PPP Canada. That's exactly what the city of Saskatoon did when they built that bridge. They had penalties built in for the contractor. So this is not something unique to a P3. The mayor keeps saying this, but that's simply not true. But that's the first issue I raised. The second one, I'm just going to get back to my notes here. Um, the second one, he's talking about this thing about control. This is not about getting someone in to fix your house. This is about bringing in a private corporation to run that plant. All of the employees will be transferred from the city. They will cease being city employees. They will become employees of the contract. Now, it was a long time ago, 12, 13, 14 years, I used to negotiate this the contract in this place with the support staff. And it was very clear in all the contracts they were negotiating. The operator controls that workforce. Every day, your boss tells you what to do. It is your duty as an employee to do what you are told to follow that work, carry that work out according to the instructions of your employer. That's what we're talking about. Who is going to be supervising and directing those very skilled but nevertheless, employees of that waste dry treatment plant. And it will be a private operator. Yes, we'll own it. And we'll have, I mean, it will have a 30 year contract. I told you how old my grandchildren are going to be in 30 years. I'm going to be 93. I'll be damn lucky if I'm still alive when this contract comes back that we can renegotiate. So that's the problem. This is a huge long term process. It's not two or three years out. This is 30 years we're getting locked in. That's not the other question, I guess. The unanimity of council, they voted on it, but you didn't hear the mayor talk about the key thing. They said, we're going to get $20 million. This is the value for money. This is the risk, not some of this is transfer. And the problem is always in these things, and the British have said it, and the auditor generals have said it, is those calculations are secret. In fact, when they, when the, uh, when they looked at the P3s in the hospital sector, and what, what they said was, those, those value for money figures are always secret, always impossible to verify, and always just the right amount to make the private delivery of the service competitive with public delivery. It is a shell game. Unless you can go behind them and see. But we have not seen these ones. And it doesn't look like we're ever going to get to see them. So that's a big key function of this. It's the issue of secrecy and the issue of accountability. Um, you know, we would say just in, in, in kind of summing up, I guess, is that we think that this question of water and wastewater, the British Medical Journal said the, the, the question of public provision of public sewage system was the most important medical advance in the last 170 years. It did more to save life 
than everything else. DNA, antibiotics, anything. Sewage is the key, right? The first step in terms of living a healthy life. So it's, it, we say it's simply too important to be left to a profit, profit-driven system. It needs to remain in public control. We live in a very dry, semi-arid place. Most years of apparition exceeds precipitation. We need to have the flexibility to respond to a changing climate. We need the flexibility to be in public control. We cannot be locked into a 30-year secret deal. Mr. Holmes, uh, Mayor Fugere, you now have five minutes for your rebuttal. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Uh, interesting comments, and, and I appreciate the uh, fact we can uh, talk about two sides of uh, the same coin here. But I think what we have here is, is, is facts uh, and not fear. And we have some fear going on here. I might re refer to a couple of ads, and, and there are a few that are around here. That, uh, and part of the issue, this is a very complicated process, very complicated project. <coughs> and most people are just becoming engaged in what this all means. So when they see these terms, um, P3 privatization will cost more in the end because we'll be paying more corporate profit. This ad here, you may have seen this. I have to tell you, it's very obvious that under, under Mr. Holmes' model, the private sector builds for profit as well. The issue is, you don't know what the profit's going to be because there's no control of cost for the project. P3 is capped at $224.3 million and a fixed price contract. But this kind of information, frankly, may get people worried that we're trying to privatize our water. Uh, we want it to remain public. I just heard Mr. Holmes say just now, he said, yes, we own it. Well, that's, um, that's the first time I've heard him say that he's made the obvious, that we own it. Of course we own it. But these ads talk about something quite different than we're privatizing. And I think that's unfair because we're, it's fear, not facts. We're talking about here. This, and this is important. Um, borrowing costs. Uh, I have a report that was sent to the executive committee meeting when we decided this, and I can refer to uh, an agent here. They, they admit that the borrowing cost, the interest rate between the private sector and government is narrowing to also be negligible. And uh, as I've said publicly before, in general terms, but not this specific deal, because you haven't gone to the market yet to go for a loan, the, the spread between government and private sector in water and wastewater is 0.5. To one percent. Now, I believe that the the document that uh, Mr. Holmes speaks of, they assume that the borrower, the private borrower, would have to get two percent above the city of Regina. It's just simply not true. So we have a lot of information that is simply not accurate, and it's a half a story. The employees keep the same collective agreement, the same job they have. It's under succession rights. They must have the same collective agreement. But they're protected. Um, you know, we talk about a thirty-year deal. A secret deal. I just said again that when this deal is negotiated, it goes to council. It's a public document. We're very confident, given the work that's been done, the background work that's been done for a number of years, that it's a comprehensive contract that protects the interests of the taxpayers. Our interest as council is to ensure that your tax dollars are used wisely, that we stretch them for what we can. That's our interest. It's not about clouding the issue about privatizing and and uh, talking about water, drinking water being in this issue. It is unfair, it clouds the issue, it confuses people, and maybe that's the intent, I don't know. But for me, it's very clear what this is about. It's gaining access to federal money, $58.5 million, to lower the tax burden on Regina Valley. <coughs> it's protecting our ownership rights, we own it and we control it. Yes, we have others doing that, we, we, we collect, we actually set the rates for the utility. Not the company, we do. If they ask for something more excessive, the answer is no. Those rates that we set for utility goes beyond the sewage treatment plan. It actually goes for the pipes in the ground and to repair those over time. Yes, we have collected money that will be used uh, for the sewage treatment plant in our reserve, but it's also used to maintain our infrastructure that's aging. As part of the $2 billion I spoke of that we're behind in terms of our ability to get those fixed. It's absolutely clear what the, what the message is here. What we're seeing from the water watch side is Moving into the area of fear versus fact. And it's unfortunate. If you want to have a discussion of the facts, let's have them, but let's not scare people. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Pujer. So now we're going to go into uh, each side submit three questions. Uh, oh, no, where is your money? Uh, so let's see the questions that uh, each 
and, and site is prepared. And uh, we're going to alternate back and forth in terms of these uh, written questions. Uh, and I, I think a few of the subjects we've already touched on a little bit. But uh, nonetheless, these are the questions that we'll alternate. And I'll go to, uh, to Mr. Holmes first with the, his first question. Um, is Regina Water Watch alleges that drinking water is being privatized? Why is Water Watch making that allegation when, in fact, this project is for sewage treatment only? This is a question that came from the mayor, and, and it sort of reinforces something I think is all those times I went to city council, he wasn't listening. We have never said this was about drinking water. It's not. It's about the wastewater treatment plant. It's not about Buffalo Pound. It's about the plant of the rest of the town, right? the wastewater treatment plant. That's the first thing. That was the petition, the wastewater treatment plan petition. That's what it was called, and that's what it talked about there. That is going to contain what is now the ballot question, the one that we proposed at work, and the one that the city council unanimously, because they do most things unanimously, that they unanimously approved. It. And it is that the city of Regina publicly finance, operate, and maintain the new wastewater treatment plan. The only people I've ever said, I've ever heard say, the Water Watch says it's about drinking water is the city. So I'm not sure who's spreading confusion here. But anyway, that's what you're voting on. That's the ballot question on September 25th. But there is a bigger issue here. It is the wastewater treatment. That's what it's called. You go out there, that's what the sign says. It got renamed this summer the sewage treatment plant. Okay? In fact, if you look on the website, there are actually documents that have been rewritten to take wastewater treatment out and insert sewage treatment on the same text but they've changed the word in. It's bizarre. It's another word invented by a spin doctor, just like the $276. It's a, it's a figure invented by a spin, a spin doctor. Okay. The, the key thing to remember is our water comes out of Buffalo Pound. Buffalo Pound's water comes out of the Propel system. Propel comes out of the Doma, comes out of uh, Lake Diefenbaker, out of the Saskatchewan system. The Saskatchewan is made up of the boat and the old man and the red deer. All those people are very water into our water. Put it back into Wascana Creek, which in, a, in, in most of the year is 90% sewage effluent. That goes into, into the uh, into the propel and out all those ways along the porch takes their water out there. Again, we talked about residential wastewater is 99% water. It's important, very important, that it be cleaned and put back in the environment in absolutely the best condition. But it is water mainly. Um, when we, when we had our, uh, our town hall here last, uh, last Wednesday, we had an environment, a retired environment Canada scientist, Marty Ways, who spent her whole life, whole professional life, studying water, mostly in Canada, but in Japan and in the Mediterranean, and she studied Wascana Creek and what was in it. And what she said to us was, you shouldn't be calling this waste water. We live in a very arid climate. Most years, the evaporation exceeds the precipitation dependent on that water coming out of the Rocky Mountains. All the water here is precious. You cannot think of any of this being waste. You have to respect all of that water. It's all absolutely essential to our life here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I don't know if I mentioned it at the beginning, it's three minute response uh, to, the, to the questions. Right. Let the dog go to you next minute, right? Yeah. Uh, so now, question uh, to the mayor. Uh, the city says there will be $21 million savings in risk transfer. Risk transfer is the cost of problems that might arise in the, in the design, building, or operation of the plant. Risk transfer calculations are controversial. Will you tell us the cost assigned to each, each risk factor for the public and private sector in the Deloitte report? Thanks for the opportunity to, to respond to this. And, uh, actually, the question is incorrect. The assumptions are incorrect. It's not $21 million. I'm, I'm not certain how got to that point unless you uh, uh, ended up the net present value of the formulation. But essentially what we're talking about here is risk. Risk to the owner, risk to the taxpayer. Who, who covers the risk who pays for that? In the design bid bill, very bluntly said, with all the risk rests with the owner, which is the citizens of Regina. 70%, 70% of public projects on design bid bill that are larger projects are over budget. This is a study out of, uh, out of Great Britain and uh, comes to the government of Canada. Uh, so th this is a risk for taxpayers. So 
We believe very strongly in concrete to shift that risk to the builder. That is what a P3 does. It shifts cost overruns, it shifts delays off the backs of taxpayers and onto the builder. They will accept the risk because they've built these before and they understand the margin they need and they, they accept that. They certainly have a revenue stream for 30 years uh, and that's attractive to them. But in terms of the construction, that there's no question this is better. So, um, no, this is widely criticized. This is, this is transfer of risk. It is a new way to look at, at how we fund um, our public uh, institutions. These are very successful in Canada. As Mr. Eisen mentioned earlier, Canada is one of the leaders in public private partnerships. But I want to stress that Council does not look at this as a panacea, as a way to solve anything. We backed into a P3 on this project after we evaluated other models that didn't fit the bill, that were more expensive, that we couldn't have a support from the federal government on. So that answer, the question, the supposition is incorrect. The level of risk transfer is nowhere near $21 million. Thank you. We'll get to questions from uh, the board later. Written questions. <laughs> Okay, question number two to uh, Jim Holmes. Uh, how will Regina Water Watch protect city taxpayers from cost overruns and project delays for the sewage treatment plant? Can this group, in fact, guarantee, as the P3 does, that the design bid bill will not cost more than $224 million? Well, I think we need to start by understanding that the city cannot guarantee so it will cost more than $224 million. The federal grant is $58.5 million. You've heard the mayor from Sheriff said it a number of times. You see it in all the city's advertising. So I was just told, actually, that those fancy phones, which I'm never good at working, have a calculator on them. The P3 grant is 25% of the cost. Multiply 58.5 by 4. You take your phone out and do it right now. You won't get 224 million. You'll get 234 million. When we asked where the ten million dollars came from, oh, that's fees for lawyers, and brokers, and consultants, and that's typical of P3 projects. They have those kinds of extra costs attached to them. Costs, um, you know, our analysis said our analysts said about five hundred thousand dollars for the city to find to, to, to arrange the financing for a project like this for for a typical traditional project. Okay. So that's the first question. The city is already said that this project has costed $234 million, up from $153 million about 14 months ago. Now, this is a very strange question. How are we going to guarantee it? If the referendum passes, then it's the duty of the city administration to carry out the wish of the voters. Okay, it's not up to water watch. We're not going to have a coup d'etat and take over the <laughs> 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 But since he asked, our advice on this question. We're going to try five more times. The sign bid, sign bid bill contract should be a fixed price contract, and that is something that's done all the time. You don't need a P3 to have a fixed price contract. You can repeat that about four times so far. I'm not making that up. But what it says it, the PPP Canada says it. So you just ask it who does it. Okay. So that's the first question. Okay, fixed price contract. Second one. We think it's likely that the plant isn't going to cost $234 million. We talked about this 50 percent of the jump. Okay. In Western Canada, construction for, for projects like this is rising about 5% a year. I don't know if it was for China, but Calgary had looked at about 5% a year. So perhaps 20% is, is the reasonable cost of the road. So there's a big, a big, uh, you know, a big uh, uh, cushion in there. If that advice isn't enough for them, I would suggest that they call Mayor Bob Maloney in Yorkton. I did. Uh, I talked to him about it. He brought in their water treatment plant on schedule, on budget, uh, and won environmental awards for it. If you talk to Bob, he'll brag quite a lot about what great staff he has in the city. I mean, like here, he doesn't apologize for his staff. If they won an environmental award from that. So, City of Yorkton can show you how to do it if you don't know how to do it to bring it in on budget. Thank you. Uh, Second question uh, for the mayor. You have promised to provide figures on how much profit the people of Regina will pay to a private corporation over the 30-year term of this agreement. Will you prov provide that information to us tonight? Uh, 
to say that the um, first part in terms of our profit on either design the bill or public private partnership primarily is, is a result of the bidding process. You can make assumptions on what that profit margin might be, but what it actually is, like any competitive process, you don't know what those numbers are. But what I can tell you is that both in design bid build, there's going to be a profit because the city will not build it by itself. So on the one hand, we have a criticism of um, corporate profits by water watch is, is a bad thing on the P3s, but it seems to be okay on a design bid build. It's the same company that's going to build it. The private sector will, will build it. The government will not build a very advanced, technology advanced uh, uh, entity. Won't do it. It simply won't happen. So no one can say what that profit margin is going to be in absolute terms until the RP goes out and we get a response. And to say otherwise, would be would be misleading. But my, mind you, what all of uh, either one are bidding, they're bidding to get the, the project, so they are going to be as efficient as they can, particularly on the, on the P3, be as efficient and innovative as possible to win the bid. And they talk about margins being less and less to do that very thing. So no one can say what those are going to be in absolute terms. And those who say that are misleading, and again, misinformation. <coughs> about the process, facts, not, not uh, making up uh, information. last question to uh, Jim Holmes, and then we'll come back to the mayor for his final question. So, to Mr. Holmes, the mayor and city council have been open and transparent on how much money is being invested to educate the public on the P3 approach for the sewage treatment plan. How much has Regina Water Watch, Watch and QP spent to date, and why have they not disclosed how much money they are spending on their advertising campaign? Um, investing in education is sort of a funny term for the information the city's been putting out. But in any case, <laughs> the question I think is just about a whole different view of the world and how things are organized. It shows that the city doesn't know anything at all about what Regina Water Watch is. Everybody who's involved in it, including me, is a volunteer. They're there because they chose to be there. People bring different things to that group, to the Water Watch. Some people bring money, and some people bring expertise and their wisdom. Everyone has to bring a lot of hard work. And anyone who shows up at one of our meetings to discuss what we're doing and can debate that and can decide what we're going to do next, and we expect them to work. But we don't ask people when we say they're going to help with Water Watch how much they're going to help. We're just really happy if anyone will help at all. So I don't have any idea how many thousands and thousands of hours our volunteers have contributed to this campaign. I'm just always in awe of the people who show up and how hard they work on it. And by the same token, I have no idea how much money QB has, has contributed to this campaign. We talk about it. Right? I don't know. I have no connection with QB. They don't answer to me. Um, they are one of our coalition partners, and people bring different contributions. And we don't ask them how much that contribution is going to be. But I can see that the rack is that the paid advertising we've been doing is like totally overwhelmed by the advertising of the city, which is being paid for with your money. Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> Let's take a look at this. The city's paying $340,000 in taxpayers' dollars on a campaign that includes billboards all over the city. And yeah, we have some billboards because we have some people who help us with money. But we have 700 people who've donated their lawns so we can put out lawn signs. That's where I see it. The city's spending $340,000 on a campaign that includes a mail out to every household in the city. We have volunteers who go around and deliver things house to house to the literature. The city has to spend $340,000 on a campaign that's based on a secret report of most of the pages lined up. We spent our money on a public report. We spent our money on a town hall right here last week so people have a better understanding. 
the city spent part of their campaign money on local costs for your house over and over and over again. Okay. We have people who don't have any time to do our calling. And we have volunteers who spend thousands of hours gathering those 24,000 signatures on the petition. Okay. There's the city has bureaucrats. <coughs> the salaries are so the for the campaign. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So the final question goes to the uh, mayor before we go to the questions from uh, the audience. Written question. Uh, so Mr. Mayor, Many cities have decided to get out of P3 agreements with water corporations because of high prices, poor service, and declining quality. Will you tell us how much it would cost us to buy our way out of this deal? Well, actually, uh, on the contrary, there, there are more and more municipalities the government's going to public private partnerships. It's quite the opposite. Um, it strengthens the position of, of uh, taxpayers. It reduces risks, as I said before. The Conference Board of Canada, independent of, of any government, says that 83% um, again are on time and on budget. These are attractive features for, for governments that have a shortage of cash to do the deal. No question about that. So I, um, I don't agree with the supposition that, that people are getting out of them. I can tell you that in Alberta, with the floods that, that took place uh, this spring, um, the public private partnerships their municipality didn't pay for the repair of the water system. The taxpayers did not do that. It was by the company that was operating and maintaining it. These are important issues to consider. And it's not on the backs of the millions of dollars that would be on the backs of taxpayers. I would just say that um, from my perspective, there are, are more being used. Canada is seen as a leader in this process. And there are as many as you can speak of disasters or problems. There are major successes of water and wastewater plants around the country that are P3. So what would it cost to get out of the deal? Why would we want to get out of the deal? We know we, we signed an agreement that we would be very sure is ironclad and benefit the city. Why would we want to break the deal? We would have a company that we would assume the risk of damage and, and issues related to uh, maintenance and operation that are not in the backs of, of uh, the city of uh, Regina and taxpayers would want to do that. We made very sure at the front end, doing our, our homework and due diligence, that that company would uh, would be responsible for those very things we're concerned about. We'd be stretching our tax dollars, protecting taxpayers from undue risk. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so now we're gonna, I think we've got a lot of questions. We've been watching them come up here, we're gonna focus on all of them. And I think uh, Dan and Kathy have tried to uh, group these into uh, different, uh, some <laughs> and Baron of the UDP <laughs> during the mayor consultations two, three years ago. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll get uh, started on this last uh, phase of um, the evening. And I just want to get a few shots of this. Yeah, well, well, a couple of things. I mean, we're talking about... Uh, private interest public good, did these two things work together? Uh, is there a, a, a way that the private economy can, can, can serve a public, uh, uh, a positive public function? I think that's self-evident throughout our economy, but right? largely private economy does, delivers all sorts of public goods to us. So there's no question that can, that can happen. My question is to Jim. There's a, a certain sort of uh, assumption here that um, the union interest in this particular case, are aligned with the public good. And in fact, the union is a private interest. It's not a public interest, it's a private interest for the interest of, of its members, of, it, of, of the individual members. And I, I uh, and you, you kind of alluded to that when you talked about, uh, you know, the, the employees would, would move with their contract to a private employer who would be maybe a, a tougher employer, employer than, the, than the city, maybe a tougher bargain, right? So you're, you're you're, you're interested in the, uh, well, no, you're, and I understand that, in defending the interests of the union, but uh, how is that uh, necessarily a public good? <laughs> I'm going to try making this clear before. Um, I work for QP. I retired almost 10 years ago. The Maryland Construction Association about 10 months ago. <laughs> I'm not 
lot here for QB. And work for QB. I don't negotiate for those employees. QB can, in fact, will, in fact, I hope, <coughs> carry on and look after those employees. That's not what Water Watch does. The key thing about the transfer of the employees is the transfer of who's telling them what to do. They won't be told what to do by the city anymore. They will be told what to do by the private contractor. Um, so, so that's the, that's the issue. We are, you know, this is not. We are not about those employees. That's the union's job, and we are not the union. Yeah, no, I'm, just, I'm just trying to get at the, 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 the issue of public public interest, union interest. Are they necessarily always aligned? That, that, that's the only point I was trying to make. That's all. Yeah, I just made some point. Uh, okay, before I get into the culture. Stepped in that there, didn't he? <laughs> uh, I actually have a premier too, but maybe I better not do it. Um, so this is this is uh, uh, intended for both uh, the participants. Um, maybe we'll start with the mayor. Our design build, build, bid, build, and P3 the only options. What about using a model similar to F4 in Edmonton, in which a public utility is created to run the uh, wastewater treatment plant? In this way, the advantages of both should be included. I'll start with that one. Uh, excellent question. Um, <coughs> we are precluded from looking at any other model because the question that the Water Watch Group had on this petition uh, is really limits us to design the build. There are many other options of construction beyond just design the build and uh, a P3. No question about that. EPCOR is, is a, a leading example of public private partnerships and other models that do provide uh, value for, for money and do protect taxpayers. No question about that. But we're, we're hamstrung because we have either or, yes or no now. False. Uh, we have a different question on the ballot. We have a different City answer. City Council passed it unanimously. To go with the question from Water Watch. They could have amended it's it. It's a yes or no answer. Yeah. Wow. So a couple of issues. What, what drives, what limits the choice is not that is not a valid question, but limits the choice is the fact that we can only get access to our federal government tax dollars, or we'll be told we can only get access to them, if we pick up a private partner, and with that private partner, we'll hire Mormon costs. So yes, and our proposal was to go with the design, the build approach, because every other one of them, uh, every other one of those brought with it that problem of bringing in the private partner and those higher financing costs. And that's really what makes it economically unviable. Okay? But again, there's also an issue we think the design bid build keeps it in public control. Design bid build is, some people call it a public private partnership because it is, because in fact it's going to be a private company that carries out the construction. But in the design bid build, many, many companies can, can apply for that or for part of that project. The number of companies that can apply for the P3 are very limited because you need to be able to design that. You need to be able to, to finance it. You need to be able to build it. And then you have to take on the responsibility to operate and maintain it for the next 30 years. About 2010, the president of the Saskatchewan Construction Association said that they were bad deals for local construction companies. That man was Michael Fouchette. <laughs> That's the question. And then the other question, of course, is that that's the question of the city. But remember, there are lots of twists and turns and bumps and thumps getting this on, 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 the, on the ballot. It was city council's unanimous decision that this would be the ballot question. We think it's appropriate and we're very happy about that. But where it stood that Monday night, that was, you know, that was not something that we were going to be able to, to have happen. This morning. City Council, to the credit, we're going to head with that ballot question. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Okay, I have a question here to the mayor. Uh, there's kind of two things in This is uh, addressed to the mayor. The voting card I just received from the city, which is this, um, indicated not only where I was to vote, but continued to advocate for the no side. Given the, oh. given the demonstrated partisanship of the city clerk's office and city administration on this issue, and lack of neutrality. Will the city be involving an independent third party to monitor the referendum and confirm the results?
months for volunteers. We simply providing service to people as you do in any election campaign. Any literature you receive from any party will say, do we want to vote this person in or, in this case, vote a certain way in referendum? And by the way, for convenience sake, here's where you uh, vote. Uh, there is no... Well, that's, that's Does it say Regina.ca on it or not? Is it a Regina.ca pamphlet? The city clerk is not involved with, with the um, education campaign and literature going out from the city of Regina. It's separate from that and. There is not, there's no connection whatsoever. And again, I think Water Watch would like to make this this way so they can appeal, do something that does say, do something after the, the results of the referendum. But I want to be clear here there is a firewall separation between city council and the clerk's office on those activities. I know Mr. Holmes thinks it's funny. It's absolutely true. So this is the same again with any campaign. You have literature given by an inquisition, convenient telling you where. You vote because the question often is, where do I vote? It's simply providing information. Simple as that. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Now, this one's to, <laughs> this one is to, uh, to Jim, Jim Holmes. Mr. Holmes, can you please explain in basic math how your group proposes to make up the $58.5 million in lost funding from the federal government if you are successful? <laughs> What we are not going to do is we're not going to spend money on higher interest rates. The, the, again, the British government says this about them. They say the reason, they say the P3s, you get something now and you pay for it later. And that is addictive to the bureaucrats. Stick to the politicians. Because we're getting a sewage treatment plan of that model and the cost comes due long after their term of office is done. And that's the problem with them. Okay? You get this immediate upfront hit from the federal government P3 grant, and then you get to pay for that. Okay? It really is like an addiction. You wreck your financial health on that one. Okay? And that's the problem. And that's the, and that's the issue. Those higher borrowing costs over 30 years, those higher transaction costs, that higher return on equity, that higher corporate profit, wipes up the whole value. It's gone. It doesn't get you anything. It just goes to pay out your interest costs. And you have to cough up some more money to about $34 million over those 30 years. And so that's the problem. That's how it works. The issue is not how are we going to replace that money. It's that if we take that money, it comes with a very long tail. And that tail's like a scorpion. It will sting us. Over the infrastructure life cycle, which concept is expected to provide better value to the rebates? Well, I think for the city of Regina, in our evaluation for public private partnership, it is with the public private partnerships, with P3, for the operation and maintenance of 30 years, the rest of the company that's competing for that work to do it. Uh, we have a Again, the fixed price contract and performance measures out during the term of that 30 years. And, you know, one misconception that may be out here is that once you build a building or a facility of any kind, that we never maintain it. Well, through the life cycle of this facility, we want to dedicate resources to make sure that the wastewater treatment plant remains state of the art, remains new, and that people are proud that work there are proud to be there. So over the course of the 30 years, we have a schedule of maintenance and operation that will, will make this work very well. And the company will be held accountable to do that. Now their margins are low, but they have income for 30 years to do that. We believe on our modeling, and it is in Deloitte, that talks about what that looks like, is a $20 million savings over the, the course of the 30 years. So the total savings of taxpayers is, is about $79 million. That includes the federal grant of $58.5 million. There's without question that council unanimously agreed to do this because we evaluated this with our experts in, in city administration, our staff, as well as outside consultants, that there was absolutely no question this is the best way to go. When we look at maintaining an asset over 30 years, municipalities do not always have the best track record because, as I tell you before, that the, the um, money we receive from taxpayers, eight cents of every dollar, is difficult to always maintain and add new infrastructure. So from our perspective, 
It is absolutely clear, and 11 members of the City Council spent years looking at this and agreed this is the way to go. The savings are with the P3, no question. Thank you, Mayor. Yep. spoken long enough about the interest rates that come with the P3 market and why that's a problem. It's a fairly interesting comment. I mean, we've heard in the, in the biography that Mayor Fougere has been on City Council for 15 years, and he just told us they haven't been looking after our infrastructure all that time. Oh. Well, and, and the other question is money. This is not an issue. I mean, there are issues, obviously, about taxation, about these huge infrastructure problems. Cities all over the place face. And that's why the Federation of Canadian Municipalities said to the federal government, give us that infrastructure money, but don't tie our hands to a P3. If that's a good idea, we can make that decision locally. Don't dictate that to us from Ottawa. That was the resolution, and that is the family general city council has voted for it. So that's, that's the first question. But in terms of the water and sewer utility, there is no shortfall. It has a revenue of about $103 million a year right now. And it has expenditures of somewhere around $60 million a year. There is a $43 million contribution to the reserve fund. And there is $7 million more the city council transfers back into, into general revenues, calling it a property tax or an F-Bullman's property tax. But it's not. It's a corporate tax. They levy it on the revenue of the wastewater, the water and, and sewer utility. So there's lots of money in there. There are lots of demands on it. But if you look through the budget, you'll see the city spends lots of money on, 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 on water and sewer systems. Most of that is financed by levies on the developers from the developments. I'm not saying there aren't lots of old pipes, but there is lots of money in that system. It's not poor. And it is a guaranteed stream. Right? Unless our biology changes significantly, we are going to have to keep paying for that. And the Obama you've noticed that the city you know, talks about keeping property taxes low, but it doesn't talk about keeping water and sewer rates low. 9% a year for the last seven years. And the city says they're going to keep on going at that same rate. Right? Um, so there's, there's money in that to do what needs to be done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this question is uh, for the mayor. Why does the city say that P3, and we've touched on this subject earlier, but why does the city say that P3 is the only way to ensure there are not cost overruns? I'm a lawyer, and the way to avoid cost overruns is to write it into the contract, P3 or design bid bill. In fact, lots of public procurements are tendered on the basis of the prices guaranteed. I'm actually uh, different with that, that, that comment. I think it's... Uh, the reason it's, it's different is that on design bid bill, there is nothing in a traditional, because this is the, the word is traditional design bid bill, that holds the builder accountable for any cost overruns. They will not eat that. That's, that's again, I repeat, 70% of public sector contracts done through design bid bill are over budget. And I want to say that that's, that's an issue council faces in, in a broad sense of our conundrum. We want to build this facility, will be built. Which way is the stadium going? Which way is the stadium protected. And uh, I have to say, um, I'm interested in, in Mr. Holmes' comments that we can have a, a fixed price contract on design to build. Let me tell you that that is not what happens. Now, what I'm hearing then, therefore, is that maybe Mr. Holmes isn't quite so clear that design to build is as good as it could be. Because once you get into a fixed price contract, you're talking about project management, you're talking about another relationship with other builders, other entities that are involved in building, and that is not a design bid build. It's moving away from that model. So maybe Mr. Holmes is not quite clear, or certainly isn't clear what this means, but what he's really saying is that the issue on the ballot may not be the best solution to, to build our sewage treatment plant. It's a different model he's talking about. When you talk about a fixed price contract, you move away from a design bid build. Interesting concept. Question, uh, and question for Mr. Holmes. Uh, why does Water Watch keep referring to, quote, drinking water and, quote, privatization? Is that not misleading the public? Because it is drinking water. And hopefully, I hope that I had addressed this sufficiently. I don't remember anyone ever talking about drinking water. It was the wastewater treatment plant petition. That was the question. How are we going to build our new wastewater treatment plant? Okay. 
That's the question he submitted. And the one he said, your doctor, I don't know where this comes from. Okay. Lots of people say it. We didn't. Okay, so that, that's the first issue. Now, the question of privatization. Um, the mayor seems to define privatization as only the selling of an asset. But when I look it up in the dictionary, it may mean that, certainly. But it also means the idea that you are contracting out work, that you are turning a service that wasn't the public sector and done not for profit over to a private banking company. That's privatization too. People seem to think, it's interesting how they don't want it to be privatization. I mean, I remember the last people in this province who didn't like to say privatization, they liked to say public participation. Remember that? We had a department of public participation. A lot of them went to jail. <laughs> Some of them went to the Senate. <laughs> One of them went to the Senate and to jail. <laughs> so this idea, and this turns up all over, people and in, in England they don't call it privatization, they call it public finance initiatives. This idea just keep changing the terms. It's like it used to be the wastewater treatment plant and now it's gone back to being the sewage treatment plant it from, from 50 years ago. You, let's talk about this. We're talking about a public asset delivered for the public good, non-profit. That's what we have now. What we're talking about here is a service to the public delivered by a private corporation for a profit. And I would say that constitutes privatization. And again, this thing is not going to be over until I'm 93. For all intents and purposes, that plant is going to be run, not only, but, but run by a private company. Yeah, because we have so many questions here, we want to get through as many as we can, so I ask you to try to be as concise as possible. This is for the mayor. The $58 million in federal funding is the top amount available and does not reflect what the city will actually get, correct? It's up to $58.5 million. Up to. Ah. <laughs> So 276 is a reason. Yes. Up to, eh? They're up to something. Uh, this is to both uh, our debaters. 
So maybe to Mr. Holmes first, who controls the hiring of new employees in a P3? The private corporation, any new employees who are hired will be done by the corporation. Any employees who are laid off, and that often happens in P3s, will be done by the private corporation. But that's, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen after that, but clearly they will become employees of that company. Well, I don't, for one minute, accept the fact that people are laid off. As I indicated before, in the provincial law, succession rights, those employees retain the same collective agreement. They have the same bargaining unit, the same union. They're fully protected. So this information is unfair. And again, it's part of this issue of fear, not facts. A lot of the issues can make people be concerned, unwarranted, and unnecessary. There is no law that would allow people, for a company, to lay people off because they moved into a private company from the city of Regina. Those employees are fully protected by law. If they choose to remain with the city of Regina, they have employment with the city of Regina. That's the law. Okay, thank you. This is to the mayor. If the Deloitte business case for the P3 is so convincing, why doesn't the city of Regina release a completely unredacted version of this report before the referendum? Good question. I'll answer it this way. Virtually all the information is available in the Deloitte report. But what is not available, and is not available not just for the P3, it would be the same for the project on the ballot that's designed and built. This is information that would compromise a fair and reasonable tender process where one person has advantage over another. Now, I want to make it clear, give you an analogy to make this clear. Mr. Holmes would understand this. When he's negotiating, when he's with QP negotiating on labor agreements, he would not put all his cards on the table to say, here's my best deal, take it or leave it. He protects the interests of his people he represents. The city of Regina is protecting the interests of taxpayers and is not going to show information that would protect one bidder and advantage over another. You must be in the dark to be protected. That way, protecting the interests of taxpayers so they're not paying more. I make no apologies for this because governments around Canada don't do this. They do not provide that information. And it's a very narrow band of information. And it's being looked upon as some kind of evil thing happening here. It's very much a common practice of governments to withhold that information so that they have a fair bidding process. It's about getting a fair process, a fair deal. So when you're playing, you're putting your cards on the table, you don't put them there all at once, and you don't say, here's my best deal because then I got you. That's not fair to taxpayers. You do the same for design and build. If the referendum goes for design and build, that information will not be available because it will compromise the integrity of the RFP process and give one or more companies an advantage over others. And that's not what this is about. It's protecting taxpayers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. By my calculation, one minute before we have to go to closing. I'd say just a few minutes each. And I think I have a question here that can be answered fairly succinctly in less than a minute with both of you. Is there something that the two of you can agree on? Mr. Holmes? Yes, I mean, we agree that we need a new wastewater treatment plant. We agree with the mayor that the employees and the collective agreement will go to the new private corporation. The employees of that corporation, the contract will go with them. There's no question about that either. I think we agree, and we don't agree, that the city of Regina has a lower voting rate than any private corporation. Anyway, those would be the things I think we agree on, and that's sort of the starting point for this debate. I think that we can agree that the interest rate spread, given that QP has already said that it's virtually zero, the report I have here that was tabled to council, that the interest rate spread is virtually zero between public and private. We can agree on that, even though you may say otherwise. We're going to give the mayor and Mr. Holmes each an opportunity for some final comments, three minutes each, and then I'll have a few closing remarks of my own. But 
that when the officer learned that we began, so Mayor, Mr. Chair, you're first with uh, three minutes of closing comment. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, good enlightening debate. A couple of comments to make uh, in closing remarks. I talked about we should have we talk about facts and not fear. I mean that sincerely. I want to go back to the advertising that the general public sees here. What I don't have that links us to water is the QB ad that shows a girl with a glass of water to her lips. We're talking about continually saying, well, I, I agree that, that we own it, but we don't really own it. Uh, all these misstatements and half statements are, are, are confusing <laughs> to the general public. And I regret that. That's regrettable that we can't have a discussion about this. Either we own it or we don't. We own it. Uh, I regret that we don't have information on the, the cost of advertising by uh, Waterwatch and, and the partners and Council of Canadians at QB. That would be nice to know what that is, to be fair and open and transparent. That's not there. I talked about the, the design bid bill in a fixed price contract. It is During an admission, election, that would be unusual. without me saying so, that perhaps the design bid bill model on the ballot doesn't work, that there are problems with it, that the costs are not contained. And they are not contained. City Council's focus has always been on providing greater service and stretching your tax dollars. And I make no apologies for that. My council colleagues worked very hard to do that for you. We have analyzed, 11 have to analyze this with our, with our staff and with our consultants. We all believe this and know this. We're very confident that a public private partnership in this project alone not as a tool to be used all the time. And this project alone is overwhelmingly positive to contain the costs, to hold the builder accountable for cost overruns, to continue to have it operate and maintained in a way that is effective and will, be, will hold us, give us a, a facility at the end of 30 years that will be fully maintained and operational. It will save an additional $20 million. I mean, no apologies for, for going over to the $58.5 million. That's incredibly important for us to reduce the tax burden on you. To me, this is so self-evident. If we get away from the rhetoric and the fear that's being spread on this one, we get to the point of the matter, I think it's quite clear. Vote no against this, uh, this project of design good bill. Contain the cost, allow a council to stretch your tax dollars, provide you better quality service over the course of the life of that facility. Thank you very much. So let's talk about a couple. Let's start with the design bid bill. That definition, the design bid bill, is often fixed price. It's not nine. It's PPP Canada's and it accounts for public private partnerships. And I promise the mayor that if the vote is for a design bid bill, you know, traditional tendering, we will not take up a petition to stop it from being fixed contract. A fixed price. Can we be quoted on that? You can be quoted on that. I can be more about that. That is the logical way to go. It's not always. Fixed price is not free. Obviously, the contractor wants to be paid for taking on that risk. But we need this now by the end of 2016, and I think that would be a prudent step. It makes sense to us. It's an option designed to build. Some lawyer in the crowd just told us it was very common. Uh, you know, that's the way to go. And the question does not limit the city in that way. That's not a violation of that process. I want to talk about a little bit about bidding. You know, we talk about building this plant, but the key thing is there is their comp there will be competition to build this plant. There will be more in the design bid build because more firms are able to compete for that work. And that's what the British says, right? That there's more competition because the, the, the P3 requires a very large, very large company to do that. Okay? But when that's done, then you know what those costs are. You've got a fixed price contract, you know what you're going to pay for it. Okay, that's done. The difference with the P3 is you don't know what you're going to pay on over those 30 years. There are going to have to be adjustments made to that wastewater treatment plant in any one. Okay? There is likely to be less water coming through Saskatchewan to flush things up. Flush things up. And there are likely to be higher standards in terms of what is <coughs> left in that system over the next 30 years. I certainly hope there are. I, mean, I hope we'll be improving on that. And those things are going to cost money. And those are going to be negotiated. And you're going to be negotiating with someone who's got a contract, you know, an ironclad contract to run that plant. And they're going to want to be paid for those additional services. 
And he talked about my negotiating history. The one thing you don't want to get stuck in is a situation where you're bargaining where you have no bargaining power. And that's what this is being modeled for. Okay. The question of the employees, whether they can be laid off or not, the law doesn't guarantee any employee in, in Saskatchewan the right not to be laid off. <laughs> and as far as I know, the, the, the QP contract, I've never seen a QP contract that guarantee people they wouldn't be laid off. These employees are being laid off by the city and then rehired, transferred over to the, to the private contract. And they have some reversion right, that's great. The city did a good job of looking after them. I'm sure the union put some pressure on them to get the best deal they could for them. But when they're gone, that company will have the right to lay off. How can you run a business if you don't have a right to adjust your workforce? And one of the things that P3 companies have often done, although we don't know what will happen in this situation, is they've often cut staff. And sometimes they've cut staff so far, so far the service has been, has been, uh, has been thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Holmes. All right, well, listen, folks.